presentation. So good evening or good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to the third meeting of our series of seminars on democracy in different uh, geographical and cultural political contexts organized by Cisco, uh, that is the Italian Society for the Study of Contemporary History. My name is Simone Bellezza. I teach uh, modern and contemporary history at the University of Naples, uh, Federico II. I am chairing uh, this event uh, as a member of the scientific uh, um, and organizing committee of this series of seminars on democracy uh, that will, uh, uh, I mean, hand in uh, uh, an unfortunately due to COVID uh, online conference on the global history of democracy that will take place in uh, four days, I think, in, in next June. Uh, Giacomo Iotti, our president, asked me to welcome you and to report their uh, apologies, but today she is busy in institutional work at the Italian Parliament and therefore will not be able to attend this meeting. My job today is to introduce uh, the topic of the seminars and the speakers that will uh, take the floor and then to moderate the following debate. I want to, I would like to remind you uh, that you can ask questions or make remarks in, in two ways, either by writing them in the chat or by raising your hand. And of course, after, I mean, the, uh, uh, the presentations, I will uh, give you the opportunity to speak directly if you want to do that and if we have time enough uh, for, for doing that. Um, regarding our topic today, I mean, I remember that uh, uh, during the brainstorming sessions of our uh, scientific organizing committee. Uh, many of us stress the importance of the Indian case in the history of, of, of democracy. And uh, I have to admit that India is very much out of sight in the Italian mass media. I mean, we can hear and read a lot about the US, Russia, recently even about China, but India is almost absent uh, from the public debate in Italy. And yet I think that India is a republic since 1947 and uh, is now the most populous democracy uh, on the planet. So, I mean, we, we should be interested in what's going on in, in this country. And uh, uh, if you think that uh, Indian intellectuals have been crucial for the reflection on the um, relationship between European and Western culture and the rest of the world, uh, let's think of the, for example, uh, subaltern studies group or the famous provincializing Europe by Deepesh Chakrabarti. India is a, a, an intellectual mirror through which we can read ourselves and also, I mean, other, other cultures. So uh, the four, I mean, everybody in the organizing committee agreed the idea of including India in this, in our analysis. And um, I mean, and, and, and in this, attempt that we are doing to study the history of democracy in a global perspective. So, I mean, uh, today we are delighted to have one of the world's leading experts on Indian democracy, uh, Thomas Blom Hansen, who is the Reliance Dirubai Ambani Professor of Anthropology at the University of Stanford. Thomas uh, founded and directed the Stanford Center for South Asia from uh, uh, 2010 to 2017 and has published a very large number of studies on Indian democracy in world-class journals such as Critic of Anthropology, Global Networks, Modern Asian Studies and, and others. Thomas also published many books, uh, the first being for example The Saffron Wave, Democracy and Hindu Nationalism in Modern India, published by Princeton University Press, and, uh, press uh, or the uh, Majoritarian State, How Hindu Nationalism is Changing India, co-authored with uh, Anagana Chatterjee, Tash Chatterjee and uh, Christoph Shefrov. And um, he has recently published also a new book, The Law of Force, The Violent Heart of Indian Politics that is published by Alish Book Company. And at the moment it is available only in South Asia. In South Asia, uh, he told me that he will the, the book will be uh, soon uh, out also for the Western market. So I think that uh, Thomas Field Rouge uh, is a reflection about the relationship between the democratic form of government and the specificities of the Indian culture and uh, of Hindu nationalism in, in particular. So I believe that we could have found no better speaker for, uh, for our seminar. 
Uh, Thomas discussant will be uh, Tommaso Bobbio. Uh, I met Tommaso when we were both undergraduate students at the University of Turin, and uh, he has already uh, he was already interested in in Indian history. Uh, Tommaso is now assistant professor of Indian history at the University of Turin. He received his PhD from the Royal Holloway University of London and has spent long research periods uh, at the Gujarat Institute of Development Research uh, of uh, Ahmedabad uh, and at Harvard University. His research concerns mainly is concerned mainly with the with the processes of human of urban development and the marginalization and exclusion of uh, vulnerable strata of the society with the construction of collective identities and the processes of mass mobilization along identity lines that are at the center of his monograph on uh, uh, Akhmenabad and on his uh, uh, more uh, recent article on uh, in uh, modern Asian uh, uh, studies entitled Informality, Temporariness and the Production of Illegitimate Geographies, the Rise of a Muslim Subsidy in Akhmenabad. So, I mean, also from the titles of these two uh, uh, speakers, I mean, I have the feeling that today discussions will lead towards the intersection between politics and religion, politics and national identities, and I am uh, particularly happy about this. So on, on this, let's say, uh, clue, uh, I will need now leave the floor to uh, Thomas Blomhansen, whose presentation is entitled Violence, Hindu Nationalism and the Erosion of uh, Indian Democracy. So thank you very much, Thomas, for joining us today. And I, I'll leave you uh, the floor. Thank you very much, Simon, for this kind introduction and thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I haven't uh, been uh, at, uh, at too many events in the Italian Academy, but I, I keep on meeting Italian scholars throughout the world. Uh, so I do know that there's a lively scene and I'm very happy you're doing this, um, do this uh, a series on democracy, which is really very uh, important. So I'm going to share my screen and, and use some slides and uh, I, I, I'll, I'll see if I can limit myself to 30 minutes. I've asked him to intervene uh, and stop me if I go too much over. Uh, so let's see if that can work. Um, let me just... Here we go. Can you see that? Can everyone see it? Yes. Uh, yes, oh. yes, yes, yes. Oh, very good. I am going to move us a little bit further out here so you can see what's on the slides. Okay. Now, I want to begin on a, on a note, uh, on a historical note, uh, of course, uh, knowing that many of you don't necessarily know much about Indian history. Um, so we'll begin with colonial India. I'm not going to go back further, although, as you know, Indian history is indeed very long. Um, so let me just run through a few points that sort of sets the stage for what are really some uh, crucial uh, problematics in post-colonial India, and, and for that matter, in Pakistan as well, uh, and, and uh, Sri Lanka, the other uh, sort of successor or the states that come out of the of the British Empire in South Asia. Uh, one thing is that, that the relationship between Hindus and Muslims is really fundamentally reconfigured during colonial rule, especially the later part of colonial rule. As you may know, there was a major uprising in 1857 in India. Um, uh, sometimes it's called mutiny in British history. Military history is called the mutiny. Uh, many Indians call it the first Indian War of Independence. It was the biggest anti-colonial revolt anywhere in the world uh, at any point. Uh, and it was very close to actually toppling British power in South Asia. After that, the British get much more involved in, in running affairs and take the running, the, the rule of India away from a private company, the British East Asia, uh, East Indian Company. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, take over and gets uh, India gets directly under the crown. Now, that 
means that event especially means a, a, a very big blow to the dominant uh, elite across India that uh, especially in northern and central and western India was uh, had been Muslim uh, to a large extent. Um, and it also meant the creation of a modern bureaucracy, a modern uh, society, a uh, modern economy of various sorts. And many of the people who began to take advantage of these new educational opportunities and rose to prominence within the civil services and so on in that bureaucracy that was rapidly constructed from the 1860s onwards were Hindus. Um, so the first thing I wanna say, and this is a, a, a well known to every student of, of uh, South Asia, that the census operation that begins, that is the sort of, as you be know, the state of art, state of the art, kind of new governmental technology that's in, introduced across the world in the 19th century. It hits India in, in 1870s and really uh, begins for the first time to provide precise numbers on how many there are of different communities. That was not the case before. Now that leads to what we often call a certain objectification and enumeration of communities. And it also is the beginning of what I call demographic anxieties. It also leads to a split a cultural split between Hindus and Muslims where uh, there has been a common language of Hindustani spoken across North India into Bengal in the Western India of millions and hundreds of millions of people um, is divided uh, by a language movement among Hindus saying we want uh, to create Hindi. So the modern Hindi we have today in India is, and this is not, uh, this is a, should be familiar terrain to Italians, right? So it's the the, the modern Hindi that's spoken is a, in many ways a, a, a result of this particular kind of language reform and construction of a common language that's written in Divnagri script, whereas Urdu that actually was in many ways a linka franca across uh, northern and western India, uh, written in Nastrik that is the same as in Arabic and, 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 and so on, um, uh, it becomes increasingly framed as a Muslim language. So there's a fun, so there, that, that split that really then matures in the 20th century. Uh, there's also formations of um, two uh, organizations, the Indian National Congress in 1885 that has many different um, Hindus, but also Muslims and other uh, elements, other elite uh, elements. But in 1906, the Muslims um, begin to uh, have um, uh, form their own organization called the Muslim League. Uh, and this is also an age, and I should just say this briefly, it's not on the slide, that where there is a, 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 de a development of a, uh, a limited franchise that begins in local uh, uh, towns and cities uh, and then provincial councils where the British begin to appoint um, uh, property and educated members of the Indian elite to sit there as in a, in a sort of uh, uh, advisory position. Uh, but that franchise gets more and more expanded. And by 1936, uh, it is all covers almost about 30% of all uh, uh, males uh, in, in India. Before This is before uh, independence. Now, the demographic anxieties is really at the heart of what's going on today. Uh, and it begins very early. Uh, in, in 1909, there's a book uh, that's actually just been republished, interestingly, republished about five years ago, uh, it's called Hindus, A Dying Race. And it's written by a Bengali man. As you know, Bengal today consists of Bangladesh, the country of Bangladesh, and the state of West Bengal. Together, this is about 200 million people. It's a very large group of, of, of people in, in the Indian subcontinent, and the majority are Muslims. And that was the case at that time, too. So there was a great deal of anxiety around what was going to happen now with the modern politics of representation um, uh, in a situation where there were kind of demographic uh, dynamics in different parts of India that, that, that generated a, a sort of fear among especially elite Hindus that they were going to be overrun. It, 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 it sort of seeped into political common sense in the 20th century. And, uh, and as Tanika Sarkar, who is a well-known historian of India, uh, uh, says there is also in this uh, an idea of a sort of uh, fecundity of Muslims that are breed, people, uh, Muslims have too many kids, they breed too quickly. And under that is of course, what she calls a dark sexual obsession surrounding the allegedly ultra virile Muslim male body and over fertile female ones. Tropes that we are very familiar with 
uh, in other parts of the world, indeed also in the debate on, for instance, on immigration in Europe right now. So th this is old stuff. Anyway, uh, uh, over uh, these, um, th this is a theme that's been taken up more recently. I'll come to what Hindu nationalists are doing with it. I'm just quoting you here a slogan that was used by Narendra Modi in 2002 uh, a, a, that refers exactly to this, right? It refers to the, uh, uh, this myth that Hindus are practicing birth control, but Muslims are not. So uh, we have two, they have five, they have 25, right? So they're breeding this uh, thing. And at the moment, there is a big uh, scare, a, a big debate going on in India around something called love jihad, uh, which is factually baseless, but this idea that Muslim men systematically seduce Hindu girls in order to marry them and, and convert them. And there are actually now six or seven states in India that have passed legislation that outlaws this. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty extraordinary. Um, under this lies another dynamic that also has uh, roots in the, in the colonial uh, 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 order, which was that when the Brits uh, took over India, uh, uh, which happened gradually uh, and slowly, th they were uh, flummoxed as to how, to how to govern and how to find uh, partners in government. Uh, as you know, uh, indirect rule was a, a major method of empire where you collaborated with existing local rulers and made them sort of puppets of empire, um, but they also need to uh, firm up and find, uh, uh, as it were, uh, 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 the, the, the multiple cultural groups, religious groups in, in the subcontinent to find a way to um, have them be represented so as to prevent uh, public disorder. Uh, and what, what, the, what, what they did was to, to uh, um, uh, create a legal regime that created community ownership of all religious sites, uh, temple trust, vak, which is uh, a Muslim uh, religious property, uh, educational institutions, and so on. So in, in some ways, they, they, they created a, a regime that's still in force today, uh, which means that communities are also defined by their, as it were, collective ownership through uh, various committees that govern these kinds of, 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 uh, of religious properties now that creates, uh, it, I mean, while it has a, a certain, you can see the rationality from the point of view of the colonial state, um, it also has all kinds of other effects. It, one of them is the desire and the, 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 the great push to purify and disambiguate uh, sites. Men in, in, across South Asia, there are lots of religious sites that have uh, that are uh, actually visited by several communities, and this was much more the case in the 18th and 19th century. And, and so, this movement towards making culture and religion a form of collective property of communities really begins a process that leads to uh, uh, eventually some of the conflicts that I'll talk about in a minute. Right. So, property and culture are really connected within community spaces here. Uh, one of the big things is really the, the, the conflict over a, a, an old mosque called the uh, Babri Masjid in, in the city of Ayodhya in North India that I'll come to in a moment. But this is essentially about a contest over who owns this, uh, who owns this particular uh, piece uh, of, uh, 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 of, of uh, uh, religious property. Is it used? Who can control it? And so on. Um, I want to, uh, I, I have lots, I could say a lot more about the nationalist anti-colonial movement that led to India's freedom, but I think that's perhaps the part that's a little more well known for, for many, especially a bunch of historians like yourself. Um, I want to say about the constitution that's written and gets enacted in 1950, that it is a, a really remarkable document, uh, but uh, remarkable in several ways. It's remarkable, one, because it is a very far-sighted sort of state-of-the-art document, it's very progressive for its time. It, it includes forms of, for instance, reservations or affirmative action for, for uh, lower caste groups uh, and tribals. Uh, it, it has a protection of minorities, uh, and, but also it gives, and this is the first time in world history that you have a country that with 70% illiterates that actually get full franchise. So this, is actually an enormous leap uh, uh, and an enormous experiment uh, of, of creating this kind of liberal constitution that guarantees a lot of different rights um, uh, for people in a society that uh, at that time, today's situation is very different, but 
at that time was a uh, majority of the population was actually illiterate. Now this, and I'm happy to take questions on this, what happens with this, with the constitution, it's still invoked today, but let me just say briefly that the constitution today is particularly celebrated by members of the lower caste, such as the Dalits or the former untouchables. The one of the architects of the constitution was B.R. Ambedkar, uh, uh, but also other minority groups, such as Muslims and tribals and so on, who see in the constitution a bulwark against some of the changes taking place uh, in Indian democracy. So along this story, the well-known story that we have a, a anti-colonial movement successfully topples British power liberal constitution and acts a, a democracy that is functioning, albeit uh, dominated by one party, the Congress party for at least the first four decades, um, is, is actually accompanied by another story, which is the story of violence between communities, especially between Hindus and Muslims. And that actually is something that picks up uh, during the uh, uh, late colonial rule. It picks up, it's a mainly urban phenomenon. It picks up in the large new urban centers that spring up across uh, uh, South Asia in 19th and early 20th century. And, um, and it becomes a source of worry for the colonial government throughout. Can we manage this place? Is it out of control? What are we gonna do with these uh, groups of, of people who are setting upon each other with murderous intent? And, and, and often the death toll ha have been quite uh, significant. Although uh, it's only really in the 1920s that it picks up. And there's a re this is also the time where modern Hindu nationalist organizations are born. And I'll come to this in my next few slides. But just to give you an overview of what is the scale of this. So every year, uh, uh, we don't have exact figures uh, from before the 20s, but we, with the figures from the 20s are pretty uh, precise, where there are no figures that are precise in this because it all depends on what kind of reporting comes from the police. Uh, and you, police forces uh, have an interest in downplaying these kind of things. But it's been it was significant, significant amounts. And this is probably very conservative estimates that uh, a thousand people were killed every year. Of course, India is a large country. It, the death toll is probably higher. So every figure I show, you can probably in, in reality say these are higher, but it's hard for me to represent it as more than what the official reporting is. The big event is of course partition uh, in 1947-48 and, and the violence before that, that leads to enormous loss of life. About a million, perhaps million and a half uh, were killed in a few months um, a scale of genocide um, uh, that's, that, that was, that's only repeated actually in the Rwanda case uh, many, many years later, right? And, um, uh, and uh, it, it cost, uh, and about 10 million people were displaced and, and left their home and went either to Pakistan or to India or from uh, East Pakistan, which is Bang today Bangladesh, into India or vice versa. This was a massive traumatic event uh, after this, all uh, efforts of the Indian government uh, were directed at trying to control this and keep this under wraps. Um, and there wasn't really much reporting of, of systematic violence in the 50s. In the 60s, it begins to grow. And then you can see in the late 80s, there's a rapid escalation uh, where you have a very high death toll of about 2,000 people every year who die. And, and these are multiple events. So when, you say, when we talk about this death toll, it's not one riot, it is in hundreds of riots taking place across the country. There are some big, big events like the Bombay riot 93, where I happened to be in the middle of those, which was less pleasant. Uh, and, and also a, a riot in 2002 in Gujarat that happened under Modi's watch. Now, what's going on here is that this, that history of violence that has coexisted with democracy in India where does it come from? Well, one way to understand it is to begin with the beginning of Hindu nationalism, which is really the ruling configuration today, and in many ways, a, a non-democratic force that has gained enormous power and influence in Indian society. Uh, one of the intellectual fathers is this man, B.D. Savarkar, uh, who, by the way, you find Italian audience will be interested in knowing that he, uh, in his youth, uh, translated uh, from English 
uh, to his native Marathi, uh, translated Mazzini, uh, many of Mazzini's uh, writings. And he saw Mazzini as, as a major inspiration for his own ideas of what was a common nation uh, and what could be, because he said like Italy is, uh, India is like Italy, it's many different societies under one state uh, and, and how does one actually uh, make a nation out of this? Um, and uh, uh, he, uh, he was uh, in many ways also the intellectual father figure of the man who eventually then killed, murdered uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, in 1948. Um, but for him, it was all about numbers. So the theme about numbers continues throughout. Um, and some people, and I say this sort of half jokingly, call this uh, Hindu nationalism, the evil twin of Indian nationalism, right? It's been there throughout. It's been there as in the shadows for a long time. And now it's come to the fore to become the dominant force. So here's a timeline of how that happened. Uh, and, uh, and the main organization is called the RSS, which I'll talk about in a second, that was founded in 1925 uh, as a fighting arm, seeing itself as a fighting arm of the Hindu community. Um, but they, they grow and you can see that the big, the big watershed is really in the late 80s, where the Ram Janmabhumi campaign, the campaign uh, uh, to liberate the, uh, the uh, birthplace of Lord Ram uh, uh, began and, and really catapulted the BJP into a, a position as the second largest and later the largest party in the country. Um, and uh, so it's a slow growth. Um, this uh, uh, is uh, uh, the core organization is this one. It's called Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sang, which is a, a organization that literally means the patriotic self-forgetting um, uh, volunteer uh, organization. So it's, it's all about self-sacrifice. It's all about, sorry, my son was just running through here. Um, uh, um, it's a, it's a uniform core. You can see they have uniforms. It's a uniform that looks very much like the uniform of the colonial police uh, in the 1920s. Uh, they fight with sticks. It's all about creating strong bodies and strong minds, being a sort of elite uh, core of the Indian nation that can defend itself uh, against Muslim, uh, the Muslim enemy. And, and RSS is all about the Muslim. They, these people never participated in the struggle against uh, colonial power. Um, and they were in fact uh, banned uh, three times during uh, the post-colonial latest in 93 for a brief period of time. Nehru, the first prime minister of India uh, called it an unique Indian form of fascism. And it is clear the early founders, for instance, pro professed, I mean, Savarkar was, was, was uh, not only enamored by Mazzini, who was of course not a fascist, but uh, uh, the early founders of RSS uh, expressed uh, great admiration for both Mussolini and for Adolf Hitler. Um, so this was a rightist uh, populist organization uh, that worshiped strength, bodily strength, discipline, and so on and so forth. They were uh, 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 sort of uh, sitting on the sidelines. The breakthrough comes in, the 19, in 1990 where they decide to stage enormous campaigns to liberate the birthplace of Lord Ram. Now, Lord Ram is a god, uh, but there is a belief uh, that he is, the, the blurring of history and mythology is very interesting. Uh, here are some of the leaders, you can see the picture here, going through a sort of in a van, uh, vast thousands of thousands of miles covered in some of these, uh, in some of these uh, yatras or, or pilgrimages, which is a, a religious term. Yatra is what you do, a Hindu pilgrimage route where you walk to a temple and you, you sort of um, uh, confer, you, you pay a certain sacrifice by suffering and walking on your bare feet and so on uh, to, to, to pay homage to the God of the temple. Um, and, and, and for them, they wanted to elevate Lord Ram uh, uh, to a, a new kind of uh, center of the Indian nation. Now, Lord Ram is uh, central in Indian mythology. He is the hero of the Ramayan. Uh, myth, uh, uh, myth uh, uh, the narrative that's widely known uh, has been for hundreds and hundreds of years. 
Interestingly, in this period, they also changed the iconography of Ram from being this sort of sweet nature, to almost childish fellow, uh, to be this sort of Rambo-like figure who stands. And this temple that he stands uh, on top of is actually the temple that they are now beginning to build in Ayodhya, uh, where, on a site that they had chosen, which is the site of Babri Masjid. Babri Masjid was a mosque that was built by the first Mughal emperor called Babur, uh, hence the name Babri Masjid, uh, the Babur Mosque. Um, and they say that this is built exactly on the birthplace of Lord Ram and therefore has to be liberated. So it's a way of igniting a whole lot of, of sort of uh, a history or you can say mythological history around that, mixing up the two genres and, and creating a huge gigantic mobilization that culminated in the demolition on December 6, 1992 you can see the volunteers here over on the side who actually broke down in a, in the day uh, this uh, completely pulverized this 500 year old mosque that hadn't that fallen out of use long time before that. So this really changed the equation in many ways of Indian politics in that it injected a new kind of language that was no longer the sort of official secularism. The Indian secularism was never secularism as in France or in Turkey. It was more like uh, equal respect for all communities, a form of tolerance rather than a form of secular philosophy. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and here are some of the architects behind it. The, they, they were the heads of the Bharta, Bhartiya Janata Party, which means the, the, the National People's Party. Um, both of them were longstanding members of the RSS. Both of them had been active in Hindu vigilante groups during partition, partition violence which was extremely bloody. Um, a, a war with the Muslims, as it were, right? And they won these uh, victories and led BJP to become what it is today. Um, they, uh, at the time in the 90s, there was a, a, a also conflict within the Hindu nationalist movement between those who wanted to aim for religious aims, more religious kind of types of, of uh, um, uh, a, a sort of more openly Hindu nation and those who were more in favor of continuing the program of liberalization of the Indian economy that had started in the early 90s by, the, by Congress politicians and Congress leaders. Uh, and so there was uh, the temple volunteers called Kar Sevak with a K and, and the joke was that there are also Kar Sevaks with, uh, with a C that is those who worship the car, the new, the private car, uh, the, the sign of liberalization, right? Um, so this was, uh, I hope I'm, 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 uh, I haven't lost you by then. I'm going through it uh, as quickly as I can uh, without uh, skipping too much. Now, the question is, so what was it that had changed? Why was it that this sort of um, rather vigorous democracy, but still a one, uh, for many years, a one party democracy, uh, but, but still with free elections with an independent judiciary with uh, extensive protections of minorities and individual rights in the constitution, uh, what, what was actually happening in the early 90s? Now, my thesis and what I've written extensively about is that the BJP's rise to power is actually a reaction against the success of democracy in India. It is a reaction against it. It is a, a result of what I and other people have called the deepening of democracy uh, uh, in the country. Now, what, what, how did that manifest itself? It manifested itself by the rise of many lower castes. So I, I cannot go into the caste system here. It's, it's too complicated even for my students. They still claim to get a headache when I, when I explain it, uh, but it's, it's a very complicated and it, it's, it's something that continues to be, to, to actually baffle many people, the adaptability of, of caste and caste distinctions. But, be, uh, be it as it may, it's clear that early, the first many decades, uh, three, four decades of the Indian democracy was dominated by the upper caste, upper Hindu caste. Whereas in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, you see because of the development in the economy, you see rich farmers, you see new artisan groups, um, you see new groups rising to become uh, not only wealthier in the economy, but also claiming representation in the political system and beginning to run. Uh, 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 for, for office. And uh, uh, by the 1980s, and my friend and colleague, Christophe Chafrolo has written a great book uh, on, on this, 
uh, what, what he calls the democratic revolution in, in India, which is uh, that uh, lower caste, uh, today the Indian parliaments and all the local state houses in each of the states in India actually look the representation of the caste and class background of the elected representative look a lot more like real India than it did in the 50s, 60s and 70s. Now, this was in, in, introduced a huge form of anxiety among the traditionally privileged sectors of the Indian society, right? And a lot of it came about through this reservation or affirmative action scheme for, for lower caste that was also expanded uh, in the 1980s. The other thing that happened was that Muslims having been a very large, the, still the largest minority in the world in any uh, society, uh, but they began to, to gain more confidence at this time. There was very ample employment opportunities in the Gulf. They were also, the economy was beginning to pick up also for Muslims. And, uh, and there was a lot of anxiety also about the effects of the liberalization that began in 1991 that also empowered new groups in, in multiple ways. So what you can see here is that, that Indian democracy really is convulsed by these big, big changes in the 90s. On one hand, you have this slow moving deepening of democracy, the rise of other and new groups uh, those people that you people you are normally distant from who either work for you or are not close to your uh, circle if you are a privileged uh, upper caste person, which is only about about 20% of the entire Indian population um, that have dominated really dominated Indian society for centuries. Um, it is the emergence of competing forms of populism, not just Hindu nationalism, but also local movements, uh, uh, regional movements for language, for recognition, and, and, and also new alliances, new uh, political alliances where all of a sudden people see that their leaders don't look like themselves, they speak differently, they come from different social backgrounds, and it's a growing unease with this. So I call it a conservative revolution uh, uh, that's often articulated as what I call anti-politics, a reaction against electoral politics, that the BJP, like many populist organizations, get, get elected on the basis of we want to remake and we want to remake society and we are not like the others, we are not like the machine politicians of, the, of old and so on. The other, and I know I'm racing against time here, I, I think I have about, I can wrap up in five minutes, would that be okay, Simon? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, the other dimension of that is that uh, this Hindu nationalist movement that has really grown tremendously, and today the, this RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh and affiliated organizations are estimated to have around 10 million active members across India. Now that is that makes it next the se second largest political organization after the Chinese Communist Party, right, in the world, uh, and it's probably larger than that. Um, they also began to, uh, as it were, in this new climate where the lower castes uh, and other forms of people who have been marginal, historically marginal to Indian society were beginning to assert themselves. They began to say, okay, if we're gonna survive and win elections, we have to reach out to these. And they did that systematically from the 90s. And actually they have also started to do this. Uh, and in many ways, uh, the success of Modi has to do with, with a systematic outreach and recruitment of members of, of those communities to be to run as, as elected representatives, to sit in parliament, to sit in state houses, and so on and so forth. But they were also recruited in to be front fighters against Muslims and, and drawing on old tropes of, of, of lower caste Hindu males being more brave and more and stronger, and, and it played to their own, many of their own uh, 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 um, sort of stereotypes about themselves. Um, it was a form of, of, of promise of inclusion into a larger Hindu society by being front, frontline fighters against Muslims um, to be um, uh, celebrated as heroic fighters and so on. It's not everything that happened, but it was def definitely a very important part of what happened. Um, why did this work? You may say uh, it has to do with something that I think many people in my discipline, anthropology, and, and I know historians are thinking about a lot which is why is it that there are stereotypes that actually are incredibly stable throughout history, right? That seems to be quite impervious to otherwise to historical changes. Um, 
And this is the case, we know it. Uh, if you look at Europe today, where I grew up um, uh, as well, uh, uh, we know it in this country around race, racial stereotypes, where I'm sitting in the US, we know it in India, where the, the stereotypes around caste and community are incredibly stable, they have been so for a long time. And so one of the strongest stereotypes was exactly the fear of the Muslim, the Muslim men as aggressive, as sexual predators, because their meat eating make their blood and bodies hot and prone to violence is something you will find every other person on the street telling you um, that they're secretive, they're alien to India, that they're plotting to dominate and so on. They are aligned with Pakistan, in fact, and global Islam. And, and some of the rumors that lead to riots even to this day are actually surprisingly similar throughout history. And it's, I think it's something that's interesting to think about as a general problem, uh, why it is that some of these tropes and stories and, and fear-inducing uh, parables are being uh, mobilized and, and recharged again and again and again. Right? So I just give a few here in the slide a few examples of this. And of course, with social media and WhatsApp, which is enormous in India, um, this is just getting much, much more, much quicker circulation than it got before. Now, I should say, and I want to uh, uh, rush to the end here, uh, I would say uh, today uh, we have a, a level of violence um, that is quite high um, uh, still, uh, uh, but not as high as it was in the 90s, right? Um, here you have some, uh, uh, some the, the, in the beginning of the 2000s when Congress was in power, you had a fairly low level of, of violence uh, of various kinds. Uh, these are just violence, uh, riots that are designated as communal, which means between Hindus and Muslims, which is something there's a lot of focus on. Uh, and it's, it, you can see that, that um, I'm just putting in some figures what the general crime levels are, which are quite low. But if we look at um, if we look at the general incidence of, of violence, public violence in India, it's actually quite high. Um, so these are, uh, we only can go by police statistics. We can see that there's actually a high level of violence and that they are picking up. They were peaked in, in, the, in the 1990s with about 95,000, maybe 100,000. And the, you can think of these as severely underreported because police forces, local police forces don't want to report this unless they're forced to. Um, but what is interesting is that the majority of these riots are not necessarily classified as Hindus versus Muslims, and they probably are, are not. But violence has become an ever more common way of transacting political demands. That if you want to, if you want to protest something or you want to demand something for your community or for your locality, you go uh, and, and, and stage a demonstration. That demonstration often gets violent. You get into a fight with the police or with your political opponents. And you can see here, there is a, a large number of them. Uh, and I, I use only official police statistics, which I don't believe, but that's what we have. That's a huge number of these riots, tens and tens of thousands that are severe enough to be reported, but we don't actually know what they're about. Why is that the case? And this is my second slide. Uh, I have one more slide and then I'm done. That has to do with the fact that rioting, using force in public uh, uh, squares in, in the street has uh, enjoyed what I call de facto impunity. Because these riots and pogroms were interpreted uh, often by police and authorities as symptoms of underlying social problems triggered by criminal elements. It's those people, those dirty people that we, we, we that may vote for us in elections, but we don't want to deal with. That was the traditional uh, uh, view. And now uh, uh, lots of these people are in politics. And that's the view you hear many middle class Indians will say, that's the problem. These people are in power. That's why we have all this trouble. But that's actually not necessarily always the case, although it's part of it that is there has been a real democratization of politics. But it's also these that there has been no active intervention, there's been no active prosecution of individuals involved in these things. There's been a few, there's been a commission of inquiry, then a police chief is, is, is transferred, but no real investigation of what actually happened on the ground, uh, who is culpable, who is responsible, and so on and so forth. And the state will go in and pay compensation to the victims' families, and that's it. So the de facto impunity has meant 
that this the staging and using violence as a threat and as a form of transactional violence in order to uh, demand things or, or, or threaten yourself to political influence has become a very uh, well-established part of Indian democracy. So I want to st stop with this one slide here, which is that what has happened in the last 20, 30 years um, and really become more pronounced during the Modi years um, is one, that uh, uh, it's much more respectable to be anti-Muslim than it was before. Uh, and you can see that, that, that there are parallels with that to certainly this country uh, uh, during the Trump years where, and, and now it's still here, you know, how it's, uh, uh, it's okay to say things it was not okay to say before. There's also a much more strongly um, uh, communal or Hindu, pro-Hindu interpretation of Indian history. There is a great deal of uh, anxiety and antagonism vis-a-vis -vis poor people, this feeling that the poor are coming to take over and or infect us with COVID or whatever the case may be. Uh, there's a great deal of anxiety in Indian society around this. And there's also an unprecedented marginalization of Indian Muslims that are today the poorer than even the untou formerly untouchable communities, more marginalized, more uh, uh, isolated from, from all kinds of things in the formal sector, formal economy than ever before. Uh, uh, so this is where we are. Uh, and the problem, as I see it, is that the BJP and the RSS have gained power by projecting this Muslim menace, and they can't live without it. But the problem is that this is a potentially a huge problem. It's a security problem. It's a political problem that you have created that democracy, as it were, had created this kind of majoritarian uh, stream that lives off a particular form of, of, of uh, uh, um, othering, you may say, of one particular community. And the question is, how long can that last? And what will it do to um, Indian democracy? What does happen at the moment is that people who speak out in favor of minority rights and so on are routinely dubbed as traitors, uh, and collaborators with the British and all kinds of abuse. And, and I will not treat you to the, to the kind of trolling emails I get uh, on a regular basis, but you can imagine this is, so it's an extraordinarily polarized society uh, that has come out of these decades of Indian democracy. I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this really interesting presentation. I would say that I, already have a couple of questions that I would like to ask, but of course this is not my role here. And uh, I would like also to uh, remind all of you that if you want to ask questions, make uh, remarks, comments on the, in the presentation, you can do that by writing in the chat or by raising your hand uh, a little later. Now, I mean, it, it's time for uh, Tommaso Bobbio to uh, make a few remarks on uh, Thomas' uh, presentation, and then we will open a... Um, uh, so, uh, Tommaso, if you are able to, okay. okay. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thanks. Okay, so... Uh... Thank you, and I will try to interpret my role as a discussant in the very literal way of the term. So to try to provoke a discussion about some few themes that um, Professor Hansen has touched during his presentation. Um, especially going back to the uh, historical context that um, brought, that, that we can see in the, in the transition between the colonial and the post-colonial state and how the post-colonial state uh, interpreted issues relating to representativeness uh, specifically, because as it was um, rightly highlighted in the beginning of the presentation, it was part of the British uh, way of administering the colony to divide the population and to classify the population into very uh, neat and stiff categories. And that's somehow helped uh, creating or bringing identity, whether it was uh, caste identity or ethnic or religious identity, onto the level of uh, political confrontation. So being part of a community became also a political issue in the moment in which representation uh, 
became part of the debate in, in the, during the long decade of the transition between uh, colonial to post-colonial states. And as it was highlighted as well, the constitution, the Indian constitution uh, did take um, seriously all those issues. And it was a very uh, modern constitution in the way it interpreted the role of a secular state um, as being equally distant, equally respectful to all communities, but at the same time, actively involved in trying to level uh, communal differences, especially on issues about caste and on issues about religion. Uh, in this sense, uh, Professor Hansen has mentioned that, that the Constitution, uh, um, well, in the Constitution were uh, implied, were already present um, the ideas of um, implementing policies of affirmative action uh, towards the most marginalized groups um, in Indian society. Uh, and at the same time, in order to um, try to somehow level religious differences and, and to, to have a state which was um, equally respectful to all, well, to, at least to the two main religious communities in the country, so Hindu and Muslim, uh, the constitution um, implied that in matters of family law, Hindus and Muslims had, could have two different codes. Uh, so for all those issues relating to marriage, divorce, uh, inheritance, etc. One of the key issues, which I think has to, has to do with what happened later on in, in, in the 20th century and, and today, is that all those, um, all those instruments that were present in the constitution, so affirmative action and different family laws for Hindus and Muslims were meant to be temporary, were meant to be, uh, to be kept for a few decades and to be rediscussed every uh, five or 10 years in order to, to, assert and, to assert a point in which the society was equally uh, leveled with respect to all communities, and, and then those provisions could be uh, withheld. What we have today is that both provisions, family law and affirmative action, are, are still very much present. And especially with respect to affirmative action, the issue has become much more complicated now, as it was in 1947 and 1950 when the constitution was written. One point is that the constitution does say that affirmative action uh, is to be implemented, but it doesn't say that affirmative action is meant to be for, for lower caste only. And it's interesting that in the 1950s, there was a, a, a commission, uh, the, the parliament uh, established a commission that was, mm, uh, that was mm, invited to discuss how to implement affirmative action. And there was a huge debate within the commission, whether affirmative action should be reserved to caste groups or to economically marginalized groups. And then the principle of caste was the, the, was the majoritarian one. So there was only one member of the commission who was a former Gandhian activist called Kaka Kalelkar, who wrote a letter to Prime Minister Nehru uh, protesting against the principle of caste being taken as the, as the dominant principle uh, to decide and to, to enlist the groups that were meant to be uh, the target of affirmative action. So, and, and this I think is one of the, um, of the tangles in which uh, the secular state does fail in being equally distant. The moment in which identity is kept again and is brought to the fore of political, uh, of the political debate, of political representativeness, then the state is that is not really managing to fulfill its target, which is to somehow level, uh, to bring to the same level uh, issues of historically. 
um, consolidated marginalization according to identity. So while the leader of the untouchables, uh, Ambedkar, was somehow saying that the state, the post-colonial state should grow a way out of the caste system, affirmative action somehow is bringing again the caste system onto a political level because being member of a, of a backward group becomes a leverage to us and to bargain with the state for between commas for sorts of privileges for having a privileged access to uh, government jobs or to the education system. And I'm not saying that the reservation policies are at all something wrong. I, I, I don't believe in that, but I, I see in this a, a point in which the, the post-colonial state has not really managed to, um, to deal with all the diversities and to, to create a political milieu in which identity does not become a political subject, basically. And so with this, I, well, I, I shall leave it open, this comment open with, a, with an open question um, to Professor Hansen, which is basically why we have seen in the 1990s where the Indian democracy has deepened, we have seen the rise of many uh, caste-based political parties, especially in the north of India, while we haven't seen any Muslim-based political entity claiming claiming space in the political debate. Okay, thank you. Do you, you want me to address that, Simon? Oh. Yes, please, if you can address that and then we will pass to the general. Yeah, question. I mean, uh, there's a lot to say and thank you very much, Tommaso, for this. Uh, I think the whole question of reservation is really um, extremely important for many reasons. One, is that it has ignited a debate about you know where many of the upper caste uh, Indians today defend the, what they say a principle of merit. We are the ones who have merit, and those who come who get into a medical school or law school or whatever on the basis of caste are, have no merit. They they're just there, right? So it becomes a new divider between those who are truly uh, meritorious and those who are not. Uh, but it also has produced, as you say a kind of reification, you may say, of caste identities, because it becomes a basis for mobilization, not just because of possibilities of, of affirmative action, um, but also because it, it, it sort of, uh, it creates, uh, has created a situation that some anthropologists today talk about, you know, uh, the, the change from from a, a situation where the caste system was like a pyramid where people were obsessed with what relationship, where they were in the hierarchy in relation to people who were below them or above them. Today, there's been what we call the ethnicization of caste so that each group now sees itself almost like on a horizontal level as competing against each other in, and the political and democracy has been very instrumental in that, right? So you see even the caste groups are beginning to sort of invent stories about themselves, that they are distinct people, they have distinct habits, they have distinct cultures, they have distinct ways of being. So it's a whole sort of uh, transformation and, and, and competitive uh, electoral democracy has been very important in that. To answer your question directly, um, the, the two reasons for this, I believe, uh, I've just been a couple of years ago, I spent a year in India doing work in, in a city called Aurangabad, which has a very large Muslim population and lots of Dalits also, or former untouchables. And I spent a lot of time, and this is actually a stronghold of, of one of the few political parties in India that represent Muslims called the MIM, um, led by a man called Uwesi. And um, they are interesting. They, they have, they, they, they uh, 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 and, and what they say, and I think what's been clear is that Muslims after partition knew most, most Muslim leaders aligned themselves with Congress or other parties because they were afraid of going alone. They were afraid of a repetition of allegations of being as it were uh, uh, bigoted people who were like the people who broke away Pakistan from India, right? Uh, and so on. So 
uh, that be the, the, the Muslim alone party became a, was for many years a sort of illegitimate uh, entity uh, in, in, in the wider uh, political arena. Uh, and also Muslims sought protection. Uh, the MIM is interesting because they have launched themselves and had considerable success with a new thing, which is to say that we Muslims are now as poor as the former untouchables, the Dalits. So we, they are going, they're campaigning on a alliance between Muslims and Dalits. And that is, of course, freaking out some caste Hindus. They're like, this is our worst nightmare, right? <laughs> the two groups that we despise the most are now aligning and ganging up against us. Um, and, uh, and they have some measure of success with that. But, and the interesting, the other interesting thing, and Owesi is a fantastic orator. He makes his long, florid speeches in, in parliament, both in English and in Hindi or Urdu, uh, and he, uh, where he defends the constitution. So the new plan for them is to say, let's align ourselves with lower caste Hindus and let's defend the constitution, right? So they're not campaigning as Muslims on Muslim cultural issues, but they campaign on Muslims as a minority that's disenfranchised, that is marginalized, that is pushed against the wall by Hindu majoritarianism. And that seems to work actually. I mean, it's slow moving, but it's working in a way that we've never seen before. So there's something new happening on that front. Okay, thank you very much. So once again, I mean, I'm telling the audience, if you want to ask questions, you just have to raise your hand or to write something in, in the chat and we will let you uh, speak directly with Professor Hansen. And uh, while we are waiting for questions from the audience, uh, I actually had uh, a few questions myself. And let me say before asking the questions that actually I was really, I mean, surprised by the fact that many of the elements that you described in your presentations are common also to, for example, uh, Russian and Soviet history, but they are, I mean, re cementized, they are, re, uh, they are connected together in a completely different way. So I'm at the same time surprised and, 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 and I don't know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to try to understand how those elements work in a different society like the Indian one. So perhaps my questions are also like out of ignorance, but there are a couple of elements that, that struck me and then I have to ask about. The first one is when you, for example, um, uh, um, mentioned the uh, Savarkar, the translated Mazzini, and you mentioned then uh, nationalism. Mostly, I would say, I mean, my feeling was that you were mentioning nationalism mostly with the negative uh, uh, meaning. I mean, nationalism as a, as a as a negative factor. And I mean, but if we are referring to uh, to Mazzini and his nationalism, I mean, the, the national movement, it's not uh, automatically, was not automatically something bad, something undemocratic. I mean, nationalism in a 19th century Europe, as you well know, was very often democratic, socialist, and so on. So uh, I was wondering, I mean, is there a, a part of Indian nationalism that that is also democratic and 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 uh, socialist and leftist and and it, when can you locate the turning point when nationalism is more becomes or became uh, 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 undemocratic and and the negative force in 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 the in the history of Indian democracy because when you mention for example the constitution which is so advanced in some ways so I was wondering what are the forces I mean if not those I mean, uh, uh, most privileged uh, caste of the Indian society who wrote the constitution, if not that. So, so this, then this is a question because I, I don't know. It's out of ignorance as I, as I told you. And the second question is about violence and the role of riots in the uh, functioning on, of Indian uh, democracy. Because of course, I mean, I was thinking of pogroms in Russian history and other things. And so I was wondering how do really uh, violence work in, in, in Indian democracy and in Indian politics? It's just like an accept, I was wondering, I mean, okay, people have discovered that if they just go to the streets and protest, these protests are unsuccessful. And so you need some sort of violence or is it out like a history, a, a, a tradition of violence or, and, and 
are riots really uh, successful in like uh, fostering some in, in 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 supporting some political views or not? And is there like a clear political uh, will to make uh, riots successful to accept them as a, as a legitimate way of uh, expressing uh, a political will? So I, I was wondering about that. Then I have a third question, but I will keep it for later because of this third question, I'm really ashamed because of my ignorance of Indian history. So I, I will let you answer the first two and then yeah, I, I, perhaps in the discussion we will have. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't, I mean, I could have told you another alternative story. I, I wanted to emphasize, um, you know, the history of what has changed, right? What, what, uh, of, of Hindu nationalism, which is a history that runs parallel with indeed another tradition and the mainstream of Indian nationalism was not um, Hindu nationalism it was a broad-based um, some people call it liberal I'm not sure I, I'm not sure about the liberal label but it was a sort of inclusive nationalism and and of course Gandhi after 1914 becomes the standard bearer for and becomes the, the key figure in mobilizing these broad coalitions uh, that are mainly poorer people, but of course have, have two elements. There's, and on one hand, there is a kind of elite mobilization for the Congress party uh, is, uh, even as the anti-colonial movement is throughout led by people who are almost uniformly from the upper castes, right? They are sons and daughters of uh, landlords and, and so on, who have become lawyers. There's a very lawyer heavy, like many nationalist movements, a lot of lawyers got involved, a lot of emphasis on law, Lots of emphasis on rights, on democratic rights. And you see that imprint of progressive lawyers in the constitution itself. The constitution, um, and, and, and I should also say that, that when, when Hindu nationalism begins in an organized fashion in the 1920s, they're quite small. Nobody really takes them seriously. It's only around partition where people, and the killing of Gandhi, where people really wake up, there's something here. And the, the impulses of Nehru, who, is, who exactly belongs to that sort of progressive stream, he was very um, influenced by Fabian socialism in England, for instance, that he had been exposed to as a student. He was very uh, influenced by the global anti-colonial movements, and he was one of the architects of, of the, the non-aligned movement, right? That, that, that was a major force in the 50s and 60s uh, uh, in the, po the new post-colonial nations. But the constitution was written, I think you, it's fair to say that uh, there is a, um, a there was a compromise, uh, and there were uh, there, there were uh, many fights in the constituent assembly between people who were very conservative, who didn't want, who even opposed to the principle of universal franchise, right? And there were people, the progressives, who wanted that, and who also wanted to go down a more sort of quasi-socialist uh, form of development, which India did in the first three four decades of its existence with a plan, semi-planned economy with a planning commission, things like that, that are very fam familiar to anyone who's worked in Russia, right? Uh, so, so that's the, in a sense, the mainstream and, 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 and Nehru really believed that, you know, the RSS should be kept on the wraps and should be, you know, uh, uh, because these were dangerous people who would ignite and uh, uh, set fire to, to uh, prejudices and existing forms of, of ideas of community and, uh, and so on that, that had already proved themselves during partition to be such a lethal force, right? So there was a huge emphasis after partition to just put a lid on it, as it were, right? And, and try to develop another kind of society. And I think Tommaso also was very right to say that that was only a, a, a qualified success, right? Uh, it, it, in some ways it was a success, in other ways it produced, it laid the groundwork for what we see today. So mainstream Indian nationalism was in the main, actually center left, uh, uh, certainly the one that was enacted by the Congress party while in power. Um, the second question, just give me one word about the second question. Just It's violence and how violence, violence yeah. together yeah. with the democratic right. system. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, you can think of violence in two ways, right? 
I mean, the, the violence is, uh, has always been seen as something that uh, of crowds, Indian crowds, uh, and this goes back to colonial policing and, and you can, I spend a good amount of time with police people even today, and they're trained to look at a, any kind of crowd with a great deal of suspicion, right? When will it go off? When will something go wrong, right? Uh, and, and there has been, a, there is a, a, a way in which um, crowds turning violent has been a part of the uh, problematic of Indian politics and very much informing Gandhi's uh, nonviolent tactics, right? So if you think of what is, why is Gandhi, and Gandhi adopting the nonviolent tactics? He's doing it partly to show up and demask the colonial oppressor as violent, right? By being nonviolent in opposition, you show the other party to be the violent party. But a large part of Gandhi's efforts in the 30s and 40s was that he went on hunger strikes whenever Muslims and Hindus started killing each other. He went on hunger strikes and said, I'm going to, uh, I have made myself indispensable to you and I'm gonna go on hunger strike until you stop that nonsense, right? So, so the, the danger of, of crowds turning violent and turning into something, uh, killing each other or, or wreaking, you know, that, that's a very old theme and, and a great old fear at the same time. You, you have this tradition of all these nonviolent methods that Gandhi developed and then became known in the civil rights movement in the US and in South Africa. And so in many ways, Indian politics really is the, uh, produces a huge and new register of protest politics that, is, that has global implications, right? Um, but along with that, comes the, the, one of the reasons why some of this is also effective is that there is a constant worry that these big crowds or demonstrations, you go and demand something that it'll, the crowd will go off as it were, right? That it'll tip into something that's violent. And it's not because Indian society is essentially violent or anything like that. I think it has to do with the fact that that, that thread, that, that thread of saying, well, right now we are peaceful, but you know, it may change. Uh, that has had a long, there's a, there's a long tradition of that, right? And, and that has been weaponized in some ways now. It's been weaponized by, certainly by, um, by the conservative forces also to say, oh, you cannot offend anyone, right? So, so there will be these uh, attacks on progressive artists or progressive newspapers or whatever, because you are now, um, writing something against uh, the Hindu nation or our culture. So we must punish you. We, it, we don't punish you because we are criminals. We punish you because we just express spontaneously our anger, right? And, and that kind of politics of sort of spontaneous anger, it ha has a, a quite a significant legitimacy. So the politics of anger, politics of confrontation that comes out of this sort of uh, the legitimacy of passion itself has a long history, right? So um, does it always work? No, do they, is, but it's, it's low risk enough to be something you can do, right? In, in, in ordinary politics as well. I mean, that's a very short way of answering a complicated question, but it's a good question. Thank you. Well, well, well thank you. Yes, because I mean, I, I was trying to think about the, the role of violence in democratic government uh, as a whole, yeah. because I mean, studying Ukrainian history, I mean, you also have a lot of, of course. violent movements and, and revolutions that are part of the democratic uh, uh, government, uh, let's say of the process of democratization of the country. So the two things, I mean, are, uh, in antithesis, but somehow they, they go together as well. Uh, yeah. So now we have actually uh, a question from the audience, uh, Esther Gallo, that I believe uh, works at the University of Trento, wanted to ask you uh, a question. So please, Esther, uh, you can speak. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Thank you, Thomas, for the the rich uh, um, um, talk. Uh, actually, I, I have, uh, yes, three questions. The, the first one goes back, can you hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you. 
Okay. Uh, the first one goes back to the to the Indian constitution and something that Tommaso already uh, addressed somehow. Um, uh, some scholars have uh, defined Indian secularism like a principle uh, through the term of principle distance, uh, which marked a difference with um, a generally defined Western secularism, though this is already a problematic definition. So uh, the idea behind uh, principle distance was that in the aftermath of partition, some communities deserved more protection than, than others. But somehow, uh, and here is my, my question about your opinion about this, this principle distance also created a space of ambivalence because it raised the question to what rights do citizens appeal? So do they appeal to individual rights or they do appeal to community rights? And this became clear uh, in the Shabano case because what, what was the, what was the, uh, the line mm, uh, to, to to assert one's rights. So my, my question would be, what did go wrong, if anything, about the principal distance um, uh, that, that Indian secularism was, was uh, envisaging in the, in the, uh, at the origin? And, and um, partly related to the first question is, is a second question more about Indian politics. Uh, thinking about the Congress party. So we cannot just uh, ignore that the Congress party has some responsibilities for the rise of, of the BJP somehow, or for the consent that the BJP had in the 1990s, particularly thinking of Indira Gandhi communal politics that uh, again reiterated the divide and rule that was typical of a certain um, a period of, of colonialism. So, um, what, what would you what do you think about the, the role of the Congress in all this? And if you think that since the 2014 uh, or maybe earlier, the Congress has somehow changed his uh, attitude um, uh, in in this respect. And and then a final question. The Hindutva has a strong territorial dimension, also no? one country, one religion, one, one people. Uh, what do you think is the importance of the, the non-residential Indian and the Hindu diaspora in, in supporting the, the rise of Hindutva? Uh, and also if, if there is any change in the last um, decades. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot there. I, I'm not sure we have time to do justice to all, uh, but I just want to begin with the last thing, which is uh, known as the NRI, or the non-resident Indian. Uh, as you may know, um, the Indian immigrant population is interesting, and uh, especially the last 30, 40 years has been a, a, a population of mainly upper caste people, a lot of them people who uh, motivate. I mean, I live in Silicon Valley. Around me, there are my neighbor over here is is an Indian IT engineer, right? Um, and um, there are millions and millions, and many of them are upper caste people who have come to the US or Britain or Europe uh, and saying that we had to leave because we couldn't succeed at home because of those reservations and that affirmative action policy, which is factually not actually accurate. But th that's the perception, right? They go to IT, they go to Silicon Valley because you can make a lot of dollars in Silicon Valley. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the the you know there is um, uh, 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 that's the perception. That is also the constituency that has been absolutely instrumental in fundraising for for Modi. So it's very interesting to see that you know within a year of his first major of his um, uh, victory in, in 2014, he he traveled a whole lot. And, and people thought, oh, he's very active on a diplomatic front. But when you look at where he went, he went to places where there are large concentrations of wealthy uh, uh, non-resident Indians who could, so he went to, he, he came to Madison Square Garden in New York. He came here, he went to London, he went to Toronto, uh, and he went to, um, he went to, Saudi, uh, to, uh, to the Gulf, right? Uh, and other places, uh, Australia. And it was fundraising tours. This was very plain and simple, uh, everybody understood that these were fundraising tours. I also kind of thank you for the support kind of tours. Uh, and thousands and thousands of people showed up. There was this is a Modi mania uh, time. Um, 
uh, and I was unfortunate. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, I, I signed a letter, I remember, because he, he also met with Google and Facebook and everybody. And I signed a letter at the time saying, uh, um, you know, Modi is a little more complicated and that got a lot of uh, uh, pushback. Anyway, um, so, so they have been absolutely essential for, for both for cultural and economic reasons. Um, uh, the Congress party, uh, I wanna uh, go back to that. Yeah, I mean, it's clear that Indira Gandhi, uh, I mean, Indira Gandhi, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, one of the things that struck me when I started doing ethnographic work in India on these people, I knew that the second time that the RSS had been banned uh, was during the emergency rule in the mid seventies that Indira Gandhi uh, suspended the constitution for, for uh, 20 months almost. And, um, and she put virtually the entire leadership of the Hindu nationalist movement in, in prison. Um, and the funny thing was that many of these senior RSS men, some of them had been in prison. When we talked about Indira Gandhi, they were full of praise. So they said, you know, but she is the one leader that India had that was really strong and forceful and decisive and um, defended the interest of the nation without hesitation. And that's what we need. So I was like, here's the woman who puts you in prison and you and nothing, well, you love her nonetheless. Uh, and that has to do also, so it's partly that, playing strong sovereignty politics, as it were, right? but also playing uh, hardball with internal dissent. They also like that, you know. Um, so Indira Gandhi is the least democratic of all Congress leaders. She's also the far most more cynical. She played up the sort of majoritarian card, especially in the Punjab against the, the, the in, uh, sort of uh, autonomy movement in the Punjab. And of course that was, those were the people who killed her eventually, right? Um, so, so yes, but not just that, Congress has a lot more to answer for, in fact, uh, in terms of building up a society uh, and, and uh, uh, um, uh, also building, you can say, a, a form of politics that, um, that was based on a particular form of patronage of, of, uh, uh, and protection of the, of the upper caste, that there was this reservation policy. Certain people could get uh, into uh, uh, to law school and to engineering college, whatever. But in the main, Congress actually uh, didn't do much to implement many of these reservation policies. It's only by the 1970s and 80s when these people begin to organize themselves in independent parties, that's when you see the quotas being filled, the, 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 that politics of, of assertiveness from the lower caste only plays out when people begin to organize themselves. Uh, so Congress never did it. They, they did it in pro forma, but not really in practice. So finally, that leads me to secularism. I think you can say the same about secularism, that secularism was a form of, it was based on this idea that, that you also find in the Hindu nationalist movement that, you know, India is a fundamentally tolerant country, that Hinduism doesn't have one God. We have many things. We are an open-minded, tolerant religion. So by definition, to be a Hindu is to be secular in the Indian sense of being, you know, uh, open to, to difference. Um, and nothing is for, could be further from the truth, right? Because uh, there are few places in the world where people have more restrictions on who they can marry and what they can eat and what they can do and who they can let into their inner circle. So that kind of tolerance is, is only at a very superficial level in, in the public. Um, so, um, uh, so in some ways, I think that that particular, uh, that principal distance became something to, uh, that became a bit of a sort of um, political instrumentality you could play with, right? So Congress politicians would come uh, to do iftar parties at uh, Muslim holidays uh, before Eid. Uh, they would come sh show, it was that kind of goodwill, but it was all the, the fundamental basis of it was still that this is a tolerance vis-a-vis -vis communities that we as magnan magnanimous Hindus are extending to them, but we define the terms. So even if you look at the rituals of state in India, secular India, the rituals of state, uh, the, the, the whole, the iconography, everything about it, it's totally Hindu, right? There's no attempt to have a Muslim or Christian or whatever component, right? So it was, so the Hindu majoritarian cultural sensibility 
is much older than the Hindu nationalist movement. And that is actually what has made it easier for the Hindu nationalists to capture the imagination and the political majority. So uh, thank you very much uh, for this. Uh uh, answers to, to the questions. And I am very, let's say, sorry to uh, uh, say that, but we are, uh, our time is already up. We already uh, completed the hour and a half dedicated for this uh, seminar. So uh, I wanted to uh, thank you uh, uh, warmly on behalf of the Society for the Study of Contemporary History in, in Italy. Uh, thank you, Thomas Hansen, for accepting this invitation and to presenting such an interesting paper. Thank you, Tommaso, for uh, um, uh, discussing uh, uh, this presentation and uh, asking the first questions. I'm very happy uh, that you uh, were able to, to participate in our seminar and, and I do hope that this will lead to some further uh, collaboration with both of you in, in the future, perhaps also uh, uh, in, I mean, in presence and not only <laughs> online, uh, uh, if the uh, whole situation with the COVID pandemic will find a solution. So I thank you very much. Thank you also to the audience, to the people who have attended. And um, uh, let's hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And see you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I, me too. I was sad when you invited me. I saw University of Na in Napoli and I was spent time in Napoli last year, the year before. And um, um, anyway, so I'm very sad that we, we have to do it like this. But you know, there, there is there was light on the other the other end at the end of the tunnel, I believe. So we we, we do hope so. I mean, oh, yeah. there will be a light at the end of the tunnel. Right. We are not going back to the tunnel, and that uh, okay. I mean we'll be able to invite people to Naples. We you we usually very um, love to do that. Even if I have to say this initiative was actually an initiative of the association, so it's it's it, uh, Naples is not the only no, no, I know, the association. I know. I uh, who knows in the future perhaps we'll organize something in i mean alive in, 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 in naples and so all right so thank you thank you so thank much thank you very much thank you guys thank you bye thank you bye, bye. bye.